Welcome to E2 Talks. It's a podcast where we chat about the English language landscape. In this podcast, Jay chats to Don Fever, the CTO of E2 Language, about the ins and outs of e learning. Jay and Don discuss why e learning has not lived up to its potential and how the education industry can utilize technology to make deep learning far more effective. They touch on topics such as engagement, pedagogy, active learning methodologies, smart systems, and much more. Enjoy! G'day, Donny. How's it going? I'm good, Jerry. How are you doing? <laughs> Not too bad. Uh, okay, so can you just quickly tell the listeners what your role is at E2 Language? Oh, my role at E2 Language, that's an interesting question. I'm kind of a bit of everything. They call me the Chief Technology Officer, and I sort of sit in the middle and kind of direct traffic between new solution development from the tech side and um, blending in all the innovation you guys on the teaching side are doing to create new products and new paths forward for better learning experiences for students. Nice, yeah. So you're like the architect sits between the, or you sort of sit in a teaching and learning space, but you're also strongly connected to that, uh, the programming team, right? The programming team and the potential of the technology. So, mm. you know, having a uh, background in teaching and learning myself, um, also from administration and also like everybody else being a student, you know, one of the things that we try to do with solution design is figure out ways to make the experience better for everybody and to get the technology to deliver outcomes um, for teachers, um, for students, um, as well as administrators to, to, to improve the process. If people aren't bogged down with doing grind jobs, then they can focus on the important stuff and um, people are then able to do their jobs better. Um, students do their job better if they're delivered better material in a better way. Teachers are better able to manage their classes and the process flow is associated with that. And administrators can get a hold of data that they need and oversight. So, you know, it's a big process. It's mm. been treated as silos in the past, but it's a big holistic Interconnected, isn't it? Very interconnected. So how much of uh, what you do at E2 Language is comes from your experience as being a teacher? Can you talk about your teaching background? Yeah, I can. Um, I've been a teacher for quite a long time, um, mostly pro postgraduate level. So I was mostly dealing with the master's level students. So it was advanced stuff. Um, uh, one of the things about teaching, though, is that um, I think the biggest and the hardest job for teachers is figuring out how to keep students engaged and motivated. So when you're standing in front of the classroom, it doesn't matter whether it's first year students or master's level students, you as the teacher got to focus on that. So um, in a teaching career of about 15 years before I got pushed into hardcore research and administration, mm. um, for me that was always something that was front and center blending in the objectives of whatever we were doing that week with how to keep everybody connected to the mm. ebb and flow of the discussion in the classroom. So so you've been in those in th those three categories. You've been a student, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, you've been a teacher and you've been an, an administrator. And a researcher as well. And a researcher. So, right. you know, I guess I got a pretty good 360 on the space. Yeah. Um, and, of course, that informs everything that we do because we're drawing... Um, we're, we're drawing from a, our experience. You do it all the time. You're yeah. in the classroom all the time. Yeah. You're building new and interesting um, material all the time. And, um, you know, your past life is, I guess, informing some of the solution design, how, how mm. we can improve on where we've come from and where we're going. I like how what we build at E2 Language um, actually mirrors a school. In effect, we've, we're taking all the processes and all the things that happen within a school and we're turning it into technology. Because I guess a lot of those uh, uh, processes, etc., that happen in a school have emerged organically over hundreds of years, mm. or however, however long it is. Um, so they're good structures, they're good processes, but then how do you go about turning that into a technological process? Well, you know, I guess this is one of the big um, turbocharging effects of COVID. I think a lot has coalesced around um, an evaluation of the technologies that were there before 
and um, really focused on the question of what's needed. So let's start with that. And one of the big um, one of the big things to emerge from COVID is how the relationship between the teacher and the student yeah. is is the critical one. Not using technology for purely administrative purposes and yeah. shunting documents and you know low level interactive um, activities um, or simply using it as a as a as a testing tool mm. um, the the big thing that came out of covid was sort of the need to create uh, a, a really rich learning environment mm. you know i'll call it virtual classroom today nice. for the sake of All discussion right. which is fine but it's a place where students and teachers go and the whole process of teaching and learning can be managed in the one space one of the big problems with COVID is that when the panic struck because schools were shut down and the need to look to alternative ways for alternative ways for teachers to deliver the materials, there was this rapid bolt together, a bit of Zoom, a bit of this, a bit of that. Yeah. You got a great quote. You, you, yeah, were, yeah. you were telling me about it. I'll, I'll let you, I'll <laughs> sure. let you mention that. So, th so the, the headline that I read the other day is that international students would prefer to risk getting COVID than study online. <laughs> you know, I, I I feel for them and I sympathize and I can understand because, you know, the 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 the, the state of the tools and how they're stitched together for uh, teachers having to make that rapid transition or schools meant that <clears throat> you had bits and pieces all over the place. Nobody knew how to use it, and when they were using it, it was so deadly dull and boring. <laughs> You know, the, the, the passive learning aspect that was driving post-COVID teaching and learning was just, you know. So, so is it, it's a technological limitation because you were a lecturer and I imagine you used to post your le lectures online. Were they boring? Well, you know, this is the interesting thing. I think what was posted was um, bare bones and nuts and bolts in yeah. terms of PowerPoints and lecture notes. Yeah. And it was what I did with those in the classroom with the students that mm. animated them. So, you know, this is where I think there's, there's only, sorry, there's only so far you can go with making a, a presentation lively if it's just gonna be a video and that's it, right? And you know, you've nailed the, the challenge of self-study and mm. the limitations of self-study. Yeah. You know, one of the things that's come out of a lot of the, um, the, the, the study and research of online teaching and learning is that really it's, uh, a, 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 it's a process driven by the teacher if you want to get really good outcomes with that's reinforced by technology. Technology provides tools for the teacher to do a better job. So getting back to your question, you know, I'd get into the classroom and I would hope that I'd design my PowerPoints in a way that I could grab the bits and pieces of knowledge I'm wanting to, to talk about, illustrate and expand on mm. and, um, and, and to be able to do that in an interesting way so I could generate discussion, uh, a little bit of debate in the classroom is always a good thing. Yeah. Um, being able to unpack things in a way that, you know, provides scaffolding that um, yeah. builds builds on linked ideas. You're an expert at scaffolding. So yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you might I wanna, love structure. You might want to chat key. about that. And how well, yeah, we're sort of talking about instructional design here, which is a critical component. We're talking, there are many components to getting this whole e-learning thing right. Instructional design is just one of them. How you uh, create the content, how you structure up the content. So you're working from, you know, uh, the, the, the small idea to build it, build it upon it. Um, you know, building out those concepts until finally there's some sort of uh, moment where the student goes, aha, I see how all this interconnects. Uh, there's a real art form to sort of structuring things up. Um, one of the things we do at E2 Language is like essay writing, for example, and essays are really complex. You look at the macro structure, the meso structure of the paragraphs, and the micro structure of the sentences themselves, and of course there's many different styles of sentences. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm keen on doing that, and um, I think we've done it well. Mm -hmm. And still improving, you know, the, 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 the great thing about being in the space and actually doing is that there's a lot of learning by doing and that's yeah. where, you know, the good thinking comes from, getting the team together, how can we improve on this and, you know, one of the things that I see in our shop um, at the moment is all the great work being done with the active learning uh, agenda that we have and trying to take that yeah. passive and move it into a completely different space. But yep. I think where we're going here and, you know, I know we've been doing a bit of zigging and zagging, but to pull it together, 
the, the, the thing you're leading towards is this concept of a new generation of courseware. Right. All right. So let's talk about that. So before we talk about courseware or what leads into it is um, what preceded courseware, which was textbooks. Hmm. Um, and they've been the mainstay of education for forever. And I believe the big publishers are trying to get away from them. So what's been the, the problem there, do you think? Well, you know, it, it, it requires a bit of a big step back. I think, um, you know, I'm a little bit older than you are. And I remember the good old days where the textbook was the anchor and mm -hmm. everything was sort of hung off the textbook in terms of the... The, the, the study schedule that the teacher created, the, the sequencing of the major topics, mm -hmm. and they all link back to the textbook. The right? syllabus, yeah. The syllabus, right. And that, you know, as a student who needed to be in a position to be able to pass a test, the, mm. the, the, the textbook was absolutely critical. But the issue with the textbook is that it's a bit of a dinosaur now with the younger generation of students we see coming up through who yeah. grow up with an iPhone in their hand, um, move around a, a, a tablet um, as though it was an extension of themselves and yeah. you know, being able to move through the electronic ecosystems. They're, they're used to seeing information in, different, in a different way than say my generation that was quite um, uh, conditioned to the to the textbook and how it played a role in and that teaching. Th they're also process. used to not owning things as well, subscribing mm. to things. Yep. Why do you need that history tech? Why do you need to own that history textbook? You, you don't. Mm. You just need it for a semester, right? You know, I'll tell you a funny little story. Um, had a house renovation, so needed to do some calling and moving around of stuff. And I, would over the years, um, created a nice little library for myself and I decided to bite the bullet and make some space in the office for new electronic gear because um, you know you need to you need to move with the times a little bit but I went through most of the titles in my nice little library mm -hmm. and I would have called maybe 60% um, because the a lot of the a lot of those textbooks were out of date yeah. uh, times had moved on yeah. you know the explosion in knowledge meant that um, basically what I was looking at was obsolete so uh, as much as it broke my heart I couldn't throw them out I just put them in boxes and found some corner to put it in but yeah. Uh, yeah. you know that's 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 the situation that we're in now where younger generations who are used to the new technologies um, don't want to be using the the, the the passive two-dimensional textbook mm. where they exist in a world where it's very interactive mm. in terms of the the communications they have with their friends, um, the yeah. connection they have to their own learning processes, even in a basic administrative way using I, I, the... I think 99% of students cannot self-study. Like it's the 1% of the rocket scientists and the brain surgeons who will actually, you know, what's the word, autodidactically sit down, methodically work through a textbook to teach themselves concepts. I mean, mm -hmm. this is just, mm -hmm. this is rare. Reminds me of an experience that we had the two where um, with some of the early products we developed. Um, uh, I guess we kind of overshot, which meant we failed um, in producing materials mm. that was that, that that were engaging and managed to find uh, a, a broader space. Um, you know the materials that we did produce and mm, I guess experiment with. Um, in the early stages really really appealed to that 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 top 10 yeah. percent um motivated students not necessarily the most intelligent but they were motivated yeah. and they were engaged and they stuck with it yeah. so you know for most students who are grinding their way through uh, a, a learning pathway um you know the the, the that that need to motivate themselves over long periods of time is a big, big challenge because, yeah. you know, it's always ebb and flow. You can't stay on that super intense, let's grind through this. Um, my experience was I was I was somebody who always st oh, started s really studying for a, a, a final exam like three days before oh, the exam. So. Same. I think most people do, don't they? And the biggest challenge I had was getting access to the information fast enough, you yeah. know, using the old technologies, whereas now, you know, with some of the tools, yeah. we, in recognizing that's the way some people like to learn, the cram is something that for them is not born out of laziness, but short-term memory. And, yeah. you know, if they start too soon, they're wasting time because they're forgetting stuff that 
you know, you might have covered a couple of weeks ago in terms of your review and preparation. I shouldn't be saying this stuff out loud because it doesn't, uh, <laughs> huh. it doesn't cultivate good study habits, but there's the reality of how we as teachers know um, students behave in the classroom. So one of the beauties of the information age is creating these solutions where the students can um, adapt their learning style a little bit to, mm. to, 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 you know, the challenge of mastering the material as they work through a course. So, yeah. um, but they do it in different ways. And so how do we engage them? How do we engage students? How do you get the middle of the bell curve or the, the bottom side of the bell curve through a course and, and, and maintain their motivation? Oh, gosh, you know, um, I think everybody sort of looks at the front end and what the student sees. And, you know, there's um, topics like gaming as motivating and engagement um, that was strategies a buzzword and for techniques. a while, wasn't it? it yeah. seems to have died off a bit. Well, I call it pineapples and parrots, yeah. and it doesn't it's really, superficial. It doesn't really work. So Agree. Um, my thinking's changed over time, and from the sort of COVID experience and how we've seen how we've had to change how we manage students and classes, one of the, one of the big takeaways is motivation and engagement for me now is is driven by the teacher and sure. how teachers manage manage their cohort if it's if it's a, if it's a teacher led um, different strategies apply if it's completely self study so I'll talk about and focus on teacher led and then we'll move over to self study but one of the interesting things that covid prompted was questions surrounding how do we manage our classes with this sort of diversity of tools that we're having to plug in, um, having to connect in the materials with the testing, with the mm. lectures, and mm. that's the sort of the rhythm and the dynamic of the course workflow. You know, mm. we start at the beginning, we move through as a group, and um, we have the, 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 the testing that occurs through the process. We have the, the group activities if, if, if they're associated with that. We have the students doing their homework. There's the need for the additional self-study stuff. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, um, so how you motivate and engage is in part how you stitch all that stuff together in a compelling way. So yeah. it's like telling a story. Yeah. A course is like a story. It's got a beginning, a middle, and the end. And this is, goes to learning design. You're the expert in learning design. Yeah. So I don't want to I don't want to steal your thunder on this, and you might want to talk about this in a sec. I just want to make one last point. The management tools that the new technologies enable us to build um, have, uh, un, I don't know, an unrecognized, that's not exactly the best way of putting it, but um, what's not really acknowledged is how the teacher using the student management tools can engage students through communication mechanisms, through the use of their metrics to identify who's in trouble, yeah. um, using those flags to get onto the student um, earlier rather than later. Now, that sends out a bunch of signals to the student. The student knows somebody's watching them. Yeah. The student knows somebody's, oh, yeah. you know, got their interests at heart and that the student's not left. Or they'll be punished. <laughs> or rewarded. Or rewarded. Right. Yeah. And that they're not in it in isolation of yeah. what's happening in the broader classroom and what's happening um, or, or how they're moving through um, uh, interconnected to the teacher. So if the teacher yeah. has a presence, however um, strong or weak, if the student knows the teacher's there because, yeah. and if the teacher knows the student needs help because these tools are alerting and flagging, um, that's an important part of engagement too. So starting at the back end, engagement is where um, students know that they are um, that they're connected to the teacher and the teacher's keeping an eye on them that motivates them to to to, to work through because you know everybody wants to make everybody happy so mm. I'm gonna do my homework um, or, uh, more if I know somebody's paying attention mm. to whether I am or not yeah. um, so there's that part the other part with the teacher is trying to come up with coherent ways to connect that rhythm and dynamic of the course flow in and, and stitch it together in a way that keeps the student um, engaged to the process. Yeah. So yeah. Um, another set of tools. That so, I just, so they know what's coming. So they know yeah. what's coming. The, um, 
the important thing to tease out from that comment, Jared, is how with new interactive scheduling tools, mm. um, the student can be kept on their learning path much better and much more efficiently than, um, than they were in the past. So yeah. if the system's alerting them to the fact that, okay, today's lecture is, in class there's gonna be these interactive exercises, and after class you gotta do this homework, right. and the test is coming in the next couple of days. Yeah. And if this is all semi-automated, then as a student I can stay on track much yeah. more easily. Nice. The last piece, Sorry. Just, yeah. just, just before I, 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 we finish this out is I'm going to flip it to you uh -huh. because the, 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 the top layer and the cherry on the, on, the, on the cake is how you guys as instructional designers yeah. create the materials to be engaging and how that connects to the teacher as well. Mm. So, um, you know, you're deep into this at the moment. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, maybe you want to just have a few words to say about that. Yeah. So one of the things that we have, have um, you know, in our innovation have come up with is c different type of course structure mm. uh, for the student. So you log in as a student, and as we said, the, the, the self-study we feel is not that powerful, not that compelling. That's sort of been relegated to a tab right at the end for those, uh, the brain surgeons, the rocket scientists, and also the kids who need uh, additional study. Um, what we've done, though, is we've built in uh, in-classroom activities. So the student logs in and there's all the in-classroom activities, which is, of course, led by the teacher. Now, in the teacher login, there are lesson plans that we've created. And these lesson plans supply a structure to each lesson, um, which, again, we touched on before. I really like structure and I think we do, we do really well with test prep structure, for example, and we've applied this. Um, the lesson plans are created in such a way that they're, here's your favorite word, parsimonious. <laughs> um, you know, they're, 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 there's a structure there. There's guidance, but that we're not doing the job of the teacher. It's not pre-scripted, for example. There's room for movement, but there's everything that the teacher needs there, including the, the key parts, the key texts or the key audio files or whatever it is. Um, and as the teacher's moving through that lesson plan, it's punctuated with these in-classroom activities. Uh, where the student opens up their laptop and does a practice question. That data is fed across to their performance metrics. The teacher can check those uh, metrics as well so that in real time so they know who's doing what and who's, who's not doing so well, etc. Uh, students are also fed off into students at risk um, in case there are students who are not doing so well. So that's a, that's a key part. It's just that 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 create that that less that uh, course structure there with the in classroom activities. Um, once the lesson's finished, it's been sixty minutes in the classroom. There's homework, and the homework replicates what the students done in class, just a different style of question. And again, all that metric, all the, that data is collected there. The teacher will know who's done the homework and who hasn't. I remember back in school, I was terrible at doing homework. I only ever did it if I was terrified of the teacher, right? Mm -hmm. And the teacher would say, right, show me your homework. Mm -hmm. And I think, oh God, I better do it next time. <laughs> <laughs> right? There's a, there's a real, a part of motivation there and engagement is having that power dynamic between the teacher and the student. And that will always be there, whether it's a, a dynamic of respect or terror, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter. It's definitely a compelling part of motivation. I think, you know, picking up on that idea of terror or the, the fact that teachers um, uh, uh, sitting on top of students and using this oversight as, 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 as a, as a quite quasi-disciplining tool, We've got to move away from that and um, I think look at it in a much more constructive way and how, yeah. how those engagement tools are able to, to, to work out a, a bit of a, a more productive interaction or constructive interaction between the student and the I, teacher, is that what you're... Yeah, well, I think a lot of the sort of negativity around classrooms, I mean, I was a teacher and I know having, I, I remember being a teacher and having students who disliked me and disliked my classes and whatever. Um, it's largely because the classes were boring and mm. I didn't have the right content and I didn't have the right technology. Uh, there were all different le levels of learners. Maybe these kids who disliked my classes were at a low level, or maybe they're at a high level and they're bored mm. because I'm just p trying to p do my best to pitch it at the middle. And I think, yeah, I think a lot of the uh, 
negative experiences we have from school are, are largely due to the, the content and the mm. structure of mm. the content and the fact that we just have no idea what's going on in the student's brain. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But to the extent that we do, we can see that as teachers um, manifest in, in the results. And yeah. that can be in their practice, that can be in the more structured and formal assessment pieces. Yeah. And if we've got a window into that, then um, do you reckon that it's something that gives us the uh, capacity to do a better job as teachers? Or do you think this is, you know, information overload? I feel no, sorry for that. No, no, no. I think I would be empowered as a teacher to walk into a classroom, even if they're little brats, right? I would, mm-hmm. cause, because, you know what? I think they'll actually find it fun mm-hmm. because they're collecting points. They're competing against each other. They're competing against themselves. They can watch their progress. You know, they won't be deflated or whatever. You know, the smart kids won't just be putting up their hand and answering all the questions. I think it makes it much more democratic in there as well. Mm -hmm. Um, Okay, so another part of of this engagement strategy, which you talked about, is sort of process flows. Because when you take a a big, complex subject like language, it doesn't matter if it's English, it could be any language, like we're talking about, you know, we're talking about you've got to learn about 20,000 words, Mm -hmm. you've got to learn about 400 rules, uh, you've got to learn about 40, well, you know, let's say, uh, 20 different sounds, all the different consonant clusters or whatever. So you've got this mass um, of data, really. I think about it like data and how we structure that up into a course. But then the next step is with the process, process flows is how we then start serving it out to the students. How much, when, you know, can you talk about uh, the study scheduler, for example? Oh, well, I guess I'll take a step back and talk about the new concept of courseware. You know, yeah. courseware is one of those kind of vague terms that's mm. got a thousand different meanings. And <clears throat> one of the things that I think that's emerging from some of the more sophisticated technologies is is uh, a, a more advanced concept of what courseware is. So if, if we start from the proposition that a much better virtual classroom learning environment focusing on a space where um, teachers and students collect and that whole teaching and learning process is managed. Courseware is the the different parts that make up the whole. And um, when we think of courseware, we tend to think of the student side materials, the the activities, the practice questions. And really all that is, is the digitization of the, of, of, of the textbook. And that's a tiny, tiny part yeah. of the teaching and learning process. So um, if we assume that that plays an important role, which we will, um, the first question is how do, you, how do we make that digital textbook better and different into an active learning um, anchor that sits as a, as, a, as a foundation for the course? Well. Um, we can do that by shifting from passive to active learning. You've talked about that a little bit. Maybe we'll talk about it a little bit more. But we, we, we can start with the material, but then we hang on top of the material um, all the parts that are going to make that whole teaching and learning experience for that course much bigger and much more interconnected. So um, the, 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 the different parts that aren't usually associated with courseware could be the teacher lesson plans and yeah. that interrelationship between the teacher lesson plan mm-hmm. and the materials. Um, in addition to that, there can be the study schedule where the different tasks and the different um, uh, 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 markers and posts in the process of the course mm. are fed out to the students in a systematic way. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. we keep that process on track in the workflow. Um, how Uh, an improvement in teacher feedback using rubrics to assist Mm, teachers to mark materials quickly, Um, how important um, components of the um, teacher management tools can be interconnected into that course. So these things are not separate pieces that operate in parallel. They can all be connected up so that you get this much bigger you get this much bigger collection of, of tools and functions that the, the technology is able to help the teacher deliver out. Mm. So courseware moved far beyond just the material that the student sees. It, it, it also helps 
the the, the teacher build that whole course from yeah. from end to end. So the 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 beginning part of the story mm. through the content and the substantive materials in the middle mm. to tools to help assist delivery to keeping everybody on track by making sure they're getting stuff done at yeah. points in time so yeah. that the learning outcomes for the um, for the course as a whole can be achieved in the mm. timelines mm. required mm. Um, you know and this is just early days because once you got some of this stuff harnessed then then you got the foundation that you can begin to move to real adaptive learning so mm. you harness the, the process the materials the 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 the, 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 um, the way in which ac- interactivity between teachers and students and students themselves is coordinated yeah. um, begins to collect the data and the feedback for the system to be able to then um, make suggestions as to where each of the students own adaptive learning pathway is going to lead them best through um, through the, the, the requirements of that course. And yeah. this is where I see some of the AI stuff as being really, really helpful. Um, and I know you have some thoughts on um, particular tools and I approach AI th- from a slightly different perspective. but. Uh, um, I'm hoping I touched on the courseware thing before I'm shunting yeah, us yeah, off yeah. down the, yeah, well, the, the, the next step path. Sorry about that. No, that's all right. So let's let's go through it piece by piece, Erican. Mm-hmm. So let's go to the digital activities for mm-hmm. the students because even there, that's a, that's a world unto itself. Mm-hmm. And our experience has been that, again, it needs to be parsimonious. It needs to be sort of minimal. Students want instant gratification. They basically... They'll be taught the concept from the teacher. The, the complex pedagogical issue will be unpacked by the teacher through the lesson plan. So they mm-hmm. sit there and sort of go, oh, yeah, okay, okay I see what's going on here. Mm-hmm. Let me have a crack at it. Mm-hmm. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Mm-hmm. And I'm like that. I get frustrated. Just like, shut up. I just mm-hmm. want to go have a go at it myself. Mm-hmm. I don't care if I get it wrong. In fact, if I get it wrong, that's a great learning experience as well because I go, oh, it's not B. Fantastic. So mm. why is it C? And then there's another learning experience that takes place. Um, so just to round out that, yeah, our experience has been with, 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 the, with the self-study, if you call it, or the part where the teacher goes, right, your turn, open up your laptops, have a go. It really is just practice questions with instant gratification, mm. uh, maybe model answers or and a great pedagogical aspect there is the explanation of why the answer is the way it is. That's that's I think that's as good as it gets. Mm, that's, mm, mm. And, and in saying that, uh, a big step that uh, courseware has over, or a big improvement of the courseware has over textbooks is the multimodality of those digital uh, questions. You know, all of a sudden you've got audio files, videos. Mm. Um, you've got the uh, different quiz types, not just multiple choice, but there's an array of different ones that you can sort of uh, put together to make these really interesting little digital artifacts that, um, that measure learning. A couple of things there. I, I, I think back to some of the comments some of my students made over the years and um, some of the takeaways I had to sort of incorporate in my teaching and learning style. But um, back in earlier days, if I, were, if I was presenting in a much more passive fashion mm. where I had them rely on textbooks, one of the things that would happen is um, students who thought they knew the material mm. hit the test, and if the um, if the test question needed to be applied in some way, they couldn't apply it. Mm. They they might have known the space and the rough ideas, but when it came to taking it from that yeah. sort of high level knowledge to being able to plug it into a scenario to get an outcome, they just couldn't do so, it. So they've comprehended it, but they can't produce it. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. I think yeah. this is one of the big strengths of active learning, where you're prompting them to get into the mix and get down and messy with the material. Mm. Mm. Um, and it, when they fail, it's a great thing because they um, self-question and say, okay, why didn't I get that? How come I couldn't make the the shift from understanding to application. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing too is what helps that move from passive to active is exactly what you mentioned, the ability to incorporate multimodality. And um, I don't want to talk about this in abstract terms. I want to connect it to some um, studies that we're conducting with a group in Brazil at the moment and the success we had last year 
um, with uh, a more qualitative style feedback from the students who were, were doing English language learning and they were thrilled that they could be thrown into activities where they'd get speaking, um, mm. listening, um, writing, and reading experience all in the same activity. Mm. It was like this three-dimensional mm. experience rather than having to silo it and then mm. at, 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 in, in some cognitive way connecting the dots on it. Yeah. So, you know, this is where active learning um, really gets powerful because that application can be woven into the core knowledge transfer and it can all be done yeah. at the same time instead of separate kind of steps in the process. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, that's nice. So those little digital activities, we're getting really clever with a sort of combinatorial approach to building them, whereby, uh, you know, we might have a text that maybe it may be an audio file or video, or whatever it is, um, from which they will listen or read or whatever. And then um, beneath that, we can add a type of quiz or a couple of different types of quizzes to to sort of um, assess different aspects of their um, abilities, whether it be grammar or pronunciation. Um, we've even got this neat little AI tool in there where they can speak into the computer and it spits out, um, you know, how good they are at pronouncing those particular sounds slash words. Um, so yeah, so they're becoming quite rich, those little digital uh, activities in themselves that we're really moving away from just that multiple choice style mm, quiz. Mm, mm. Um, but still, I see, I see these digital activities as important, but only just one small part of courseware in total. Mm. Something else you made me think about as um, we sort of move through this is how what you guys are doing with content design is really changing the concept of um, the material as the students see it. Now, one of the things that we've learned is that um, if you throw up a digital activity in front of a student, they don't really care how fancy it is no. or, you know, how graphically sophisticated it is. Um, yeah. They're focusing on substance over form. So they're moving through these activities 30 seconds a pop. And um, if you over-engineer and you over um, produce and spend three hours as a content designer on the aesthetic, yeah. um, you're missing the point in the whole oh, it's process. It's disposable stuff. Right. Do you want to talk a little bit more about that from sort of the learning design and how the shape and the look of this more interactive yeah. active space is, is changing what we think of in terms of, 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 of what that content um, what that content is and the function it's meant to perform. Yeah, yeah. So, so we've changed our philosophy with instructional design. We used to have a very heavy sort of style guide and, um, you know, almost like a storybook type of thing. We, we over-engineered it. It was too much. Um, we found that students really want to just get in there, as I mentioned before, and just have a crack. They just want to try the answer out. They don't care... Well, first of all, they can't teach themselves from reading stuff. Reading, inst They won't even read the instructions. <laughs> like, when all else fails, read the instructions. They won't even do that, honestly. They just, I mean, the beauty of these digital activities is they're sitting there and it's ready to be press submit, and that's mm -hmm. what they want to do. So, yeah, so instructional design is very much the marriage of aesthetics or style and substance, and we're very much, uh, we've moved to a very minimal aesthetic and just oodles of questions, heaps of questions, so they can just bang them out mm -hmm. and start to improve and go, aha, I see what's going on. That's that's important because it seems to shift, um, you know, digital publishing in a in a whole new direction and a different approach to what that yeah. material is. Instead of a textbook that you know a, a textbook author spends years putting together, and then the editor moving through and. Um, in many cases, um, producing a work of art. I, I'm, the cool thing about the digital format too is there's no real estate boundaries. Mm. A textbook, uh, when you publish a book, there's a cost per page, etc. And, and I imagine with ink, etc. Uh, with the digital format, it's just uh, you've got a, a, a massive land that you can just—it's infinite. So mm. you can just produce as many as you want. What about the organic nature of, you know, the, the, the ability to change those activities on the fly and, you know, how, yeah. how is that going to change the space, do you think, from a, 
uh, a content creator's perspective or the teacher's ability to get in and shape what they're doing? Yeah, well, I mean, you architected this up and it's really clever, but, um, you know, we, we just put the course into edit mode, make changes, and then republish it. We might get in there and change something. It might take us 30 seconds. Mm. It might be a spelling error or something in there, or we might get in there and redesign an entire module it might take a few days, but again, we're putting the course in edit mode, clicking, you know, working it through, republishing it. The student doesn't know; it just reappears magically in a in a better format, and it's been updated. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I mean, and it's it, it, there's no, you know, I guess there's a version control, but we don't have to release a new book or anything. Mm-hmm. How does that impact on, you know, innovation? Let's say, for example, and the organic nature, the the new digital course, and mm. um, uh, what I mean is. Uh, you guys are learning uh, new techniques and approaches to improve the materials. How does the the fluidity, I guess, yeah, and the, yeah. the, the the versatility of this new this new medium effectively what it is? It's it's, oh, well, it's a big experiment, and we're just iteratively improving it. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think about uh, it's pretty funny. Yesterday, I, we sat down and. and um, had another crack at building a, a video. Mm. I mean, video is an important aspect, of course, where I think it's often overemphasized. You know, the vi- vi- can videos drive coursework and they drive learning? They're not bad, but mm-hmm. in, inferior to a live teacher in a, in a, if it's an online class or face-to-face, inferior. But yeah, yeah, they're, they're helpful. But again, like retention rates on videos are low. How many people sit through that two-hour lecture recording? Yeah, yeah. One of the things that we've learned looking at data that the systems pump out is the students will 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 do a little bit of taste test of the video, shut it down, and then jump straight into the exactly. So so would I. Yeah, I I can't bear to watch something that's boring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. But you know, at least I'd let it run in the background (laughs) so that it'd generate an analytic that I actually did it, whether I actually watched it or not. But we so so I'll just tell the listeners we're we're obsessed with making sticky YouTube videos, and we've become extremely good at it. (laughs) We've now got 1.3 million YouTube subscribers across our test prep platforms, and uh, we're now making headway into the general English learning space, where you know the numbers of learners is you know, times a hundred, times a thousand possibly. Mm. Um, and so yesterday I was sitting down and creating a, we've been doing this for like six years, mm. seven years, making mm. these little videos for general English. Um, and the latest iteration is, you know, we're really thinking about engagement in that the video, at no point can the video be boring where they'll go, I'm sick of this, I'm going to watch something else. Mm. Mm. So we have to constantly hold their attention through a seven or eight minute video where there's a few key takeaway points where they'll learn a bit of grammar, you know, a grammar point and a few key words. So the way that I sort of thought about making this video was like this. If you're watching a film, there's a narrative arc where there's a beginning and there's an end, right? And people want, uh, directors want people to watch the film from beginning to end and enjoy it. That film's then made up of scenes or chapters. And each chapter has to have a narrative arc with a beginning and an end and a compelling reason to watch it until the end. And then you can drill down even further where, imagine you're reading a book, which is a similar sort of um, yeah, format. Um, every sentence has to be compelling, where it will drive you from the subject to the object of that sentence, and then on to the next subject of the next sentence, etc. Mm. So what we needed to think of with these videos is uh, how to keep them on there. And the way that we're developing our general English language learning videos now is that they are activity driven. Again, they just want to do it. They don't want to hear about it. They don't mm. want to hear about me talking about the present perfect or the mm. whatever. They're just like, shut up. <laughs> Let me have a crack at it. Mm-hmm. Right? And so the way that I do that is sort of in these videos is try and just facilitate that, get them ready, say, okay, here you go. And again, make the activity super short, um, instant gratification. Here's the answer. Short explanation of why it is in case they're like, unsure even if they got it right or if they got it wrong why it is c and not b for example so so what you're fooling around with is finding a new balance between knowledge transfer on the one hand and interactive um engagement on the other hand where you're you're blending the the i guess to some extent theory and practice together in the same space yeah is that what you're yeah yeah and and we talk about this a lot you know one thing i'm very conscious of is cognitive load. And I think, 
you listen to a lecture and it's just too much information. And yeah. so we keep this slim, right? Mm -hmm. We do, we ultimately, <laughs> this is sort of ironic, we ultimately don't want the students to have to think, mm -hmm. which sounds crazy because it's learning, but we almost want them to just be relaxed and get it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, a, there's, there's an onerous aspect of learning which you need to, at some point it's inevitable. You're going to have to hit a complex concept and think it through, but that's where the teacher will really help you to unpack it. Mm -hmm. But if you're on your own lying on the couch watching YouTube videos, the thinking aspect has to be minimal. Mm. This is interesting because one thing that I'm thinking about now is um, we've, we've got a new set of tools that we built um, in terms of virtual classroom and content engine um, that anybody could use. So let's say a, yeah. a school decides to take um, our, 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 our new virtual classroom product on board. Um, the, the teachers get access to the tools where they can create their own materials. One of the things that um, I can't help but think about is how radical or how big the shift is from the teacher's perspective from going from a conventional classroom to a digital classroom. Is it, is it a big shift in your experience? I know you've been at this for quite some time, but now that we have the technologies and the tools to, to, to provide the opportunity for that shift to occur, will the shift occur um, mm. with uptake by the general um, teaching profession and population? Mm. And, um, uh, you know, I guess to some extent, what do we need to do to be able to help the, the profession move into that very different space where they can use the technologies to, to improve the outcomes. So the biggest thing is that you cannot get away with uh, being ill prepared. Um, you know, as a teacher, I would walk into the classroom and I could just sort of think on the spot about what I'm going to teach. And I think teachers got a rude surprise about uh, really, again, keeping attention levels, motivation levels high. And I think that harks back to what we talked about before, where students would rather risk getting coronavirus than study online. <laughs> anyway, there's, Donnie, there's heaps, heaps more to talk about, actually. Mm -hmm. And I know you have a meeting in five minutes. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to wrap this one up. But what we're going to do is from here, we're going to sort of split the podcast up a little bit. We're going to start a new podcast called E2 Learning where we're going to get deep into e-learning. And I think we've got lots to talk about. We do have lots to talk about. So um, uh, from what I know, you're going to carry on the more student-oriented E2 Talks, which is more yeah. for the, 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 the English language learner E2 test prep E2 school. Yeah. Um, you know, and you've got, you've got a, a great thing going there with lots of interesting people. Um, I'm happy to help you out with getting the E2 Learning um, cool. stream kicked off and we'll maybe dive into some juicy topics. We've got plenty of interesting people we can ask to help us. Good one. Um, yeah, terrific. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking if we want to pick up from here for E2 Learning, we might kick around the active learning uh, idea a little bit next time perhaps yeah Look maybe focus honestly mm. we could just focus on one of those components and flesh it out well that's what I was thinking when you were starting into your explanation yeah. of you know how you see that 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 space and um, it's a topic in its own right um, uh, another thing I'd kind of like to play with if we get a series going is we've got that big research project rolling out and yeah. I'd like to bring in a couple of the stakeholders and the partners we have in that looking at yeah. um, some uh, looking at this idea of advanced e-learning and whether or not it's generating better teaching and learning outcomes for students and we'll we'll sort of follow the progress of that through the semester because it's 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 live it's happening it's fantastic cutting edge um, and people might enjoy just um, keeping up to date with what's happening with that but um, there's there's a whole ton of topics that we can dive into and keep it interesting with getting the experts in and away we go from there. Sounds good. Let's do it. Let's do it, Jared. This was a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> I think we just got the conversation started. So yep. um, let's, just warming uh, up. <laughs> let's 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 push on and uh, and see where it goes over the course of the year. Cool. Sounds good. Thanks, Don. Thanks for listening to E2 Talks. Remember to check out e2language.com for PTE, IELTS, OET, and TOEFL courses. 
And if you need help with general English language learning, check out e2school.com. Thanks.